Nothing doubting should be the Christian's motto in prayer. The petitioner must not shift backwards and forwards between faith and doubt like a tumbling billow of the sea. He must not swing like a pendulum between cheerful confidence and dark suspicion. It must be his fixed persuasion that God is and that he is the hearer of prayer. This is a quote coming to you from the pulpit commentary. In this broadcast, we are continuing our new series based on the theme, Preparing for Jesus' Coming. We will continue our study in expository fashion with the book of James. In this particular broadcast, we will use as our main text, James 1, 6, which says, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now James begins this verse with the words, But let him ask in faith. Whatever you need today, first and foremost, you have to ask for it. That implies that you must have a prayer life. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Then in verse 8, he said, For everyone that asks, receives. So no one's left out. But in James 4, 2, James said, Yet you have not, because you ask not. I wonder how many things that you and I both are without today because we fail to ask. We need to ask to pray. That's the first thing that needs to be done. Secondly, we must ask God for it. This is very important that we look to God for what we need. James 1 5, he said, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Then in Matthew seven eleven, Jesus said, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So we get the picture of God being our Heavenly Father. And he's a giver. He's a liberal giver. And he has good things to give. So we must ask God for it. And lastly, we must ask in faith. Hebrews eleven six says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that, <clears throat> he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We must believe that God is. He is all that he has said he would be. He is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, he is a, a prayer answering God. But James 4, 3 says, Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss. It's so important that you ask in faith. That you first of all ask, you ask God for what you need, and you ask in faith. James said, but let him ask in faith. This is the essential condition to prevailing prayer. It's the indispensable requisite to success in prayer. In fact, prayer is not real unless it is the expression of faith. It must be inspired by perfect confidence in God's readiness to help. But let him ask in faith. 
This requires that you believe that God is. That God is all good. He is all loving. He is all powerful. And not only that God is, but that he has all good. And he is ever ready to impart that good to you, whatever you need. But let him ask in faith. What James was saying here is this. Come to God with utmost confidence, with full conviction, with the most entire assurance that what you're asking from him, he will give it to you. Come to him with unwavering confidence that he will do what is right and best. He is able to do what you ask of him. Come with confidence in his goodness and his mercy. The New Commentary said this, Real faith is the persuasion that God can and will give what we ask. The Pulpit Commentary said, God our Father demands the confidence of his children. Wearsby Study Bible said, What God promises, he performs. All we need to do is believe. The Grace and Truth Study Bible said, The basis of faith is God's awesome power. He does not just make promises, he fulfills them. Because there is nothing in the world that could possibly be strong enough to stop him. Faith means being persuaded of that fact. Do you believe that today? God just doesn't make promises, but he fulfills them. And there is nothing in this world that's strong enough to stop him from f fulfilling his promise to you today. And lastly, Charles Spurgeon said, Christian, take good care of thy faith, for recollect faith is the only way whereby thou canst obtain blessings. If we want blessings from God, nothing can fetch them down but faith. Then James went on to say, he said, but let him ask, in faith, and he added two words, nothing wavering. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. And we see this in Matthew twenty one twenty one, where Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Then he also uh, said in Mark eleven twenty three, That whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Nothing wavering, nothing, nothing wavering. Have faith and doubt not, shall not doubt in his heart. That word wavering there, it is diacrino in the Greek. And it means doubting. What James is saying when he said nothing doubting, he was saying with no doubting that God can or wants to answer your prayer. No doubting, no hesitancy, no vacillation of mind where you're questioning God, no wondering whether or not he will answer. James calls doubt here wavering, and he's referring to that inner moral conflict or that distrust in God, where you vibrate between belief and unbelief, 
where you vibrate between self-reliance and God-reliance. Nothing wavering. Not disputing God's power or promise. Not staggering at the promise of God through unbelief. The popular commentary said this, To doubt is the very antithesis of faith and is an insult to the kindness and goodness of the Lord. So every time you doubt, you are insulting God's kindness and his goodness. The exposition of the epistle of James said this, People deceive themselves when they think they doubt because they do not know God's will. They are mainly hesitating over God's power. Sometimes we think, well, I, I have some doubts because you're not sure of the will of God. But if you look deeper, there may, it may be that you are doubting God's power. Is he able to do this for me? But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Then James took us a little deeper in that concept of wavering. He said, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. Now, in my studies, I found out that the, uh, there are both Greek and Jewish sources that portray the doubter or the unstable one as being blown on the sea. They uh, compare him to a wave of the sea, like a wave of the sea. And when you think about that wave, the, the wave has no stability. It's at the mercy of every wind. It's up one minute and down the next. Now, let me ask you today, what are the waves in your life? What are those outside forces, those voices, voices, voices that are coming at you? Those words, the influences, who's talking to you? Who's influencing you? Who are you believing today? Who's causing you this instability that you're like a wave of the sea doubting God's word or his promises. James condemns that attitude that questions whether or not God and his word can be trusted. He condemns that attitude that doubts God's ability or willingness to provide what you need like a wave of the sea. This is what it looks like. You believe God's going to work something out for you, but then you jump at it yourself and you make your own decision. Or you turn over a problem to the Lord and then the next day, because nothing has shown up by way of solution, you go and Attempt to solve it yourself, like a wave of the sea. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. And then he went on to add, driven with the wind and tossed. Driven with the wind. This is talking about the, the, those external pressures coming at you. Driven, you're driven, you're at the mercy of the wind and the waves. You're driven with the wind. Whatever, uh, somebody comes and tells you this, so you're driven that way. Or another person comes and gives you another idea or another thought and you go that way. You're back and forth, driven with the wind. And then it, it, he said, and tossed. This is talking about the inner turmoil. You're tossed to and fro by your own instability, by your own indecision. And because you are in this state uh, where you have unsettled convictions and hopes, then you're uh, uh, prey to this, to being driven by every new feeling or new idea or new concept 
that comes along. The commentary, Be Mature, said this. Many Christians live like corks on the waves, up one minute, down the next, tossed back and forth. This kind of experience is evidence of immaturity. Let me ask you, what about you? Does this describe your Christian experience? Do you live like a cork on the waves, up one minute, down the next, tossed back and forth? Well, how about today you settle it in your heart that you have a heavenly Father who is all good, all loving, and all powerful, and who has all good and is ever ready to impart it to you. Be fully persuaded and confident that he can and will give you what you ask as long as you're asking that which is according to his will. What he promises, he performs. All you have to do is believe. With that in mind, make nothing doubting your motto in prayer. Make it your fixed persuasion that God is able and that he is the hearer of prayer, your prayer. Our time is up for today's broadcast, but I encourage you, stay tuned for our next teaching as we continue our study of the theme, Preparing for Jesus is Coming. This is Connie Giordano with Walking in Truth Ministry, praying that you will walk in the truth every day of your life. In Jesus' name, amen.